Hello Grade 12s. In this particular video we're going to be looking at the graph of the derivative of a function. So we're going to be looking at a graph that is defined not as y is equal to fx, which we normally have. We're going to be looking at a graph that is defined as y is equal to the first derivative of fx. So we first have to look at some concepts looking at the graph of y is equal to the first derivative of x. So what they will do is they will go and they will give you a graph and the graph will not be defined as y is equal to fx, the graph will be defined as y is equal to the first derivative of fx. So please guys don't let the visuals fool you because we're going to make certain deductions about fx based on this graph but the deductions we make is not going to look the same way it normally looks. So just follow along, see how you go, and if you have a serious issue with a section, please make a note of it and either book an ASP with your teacher or send an email or something, just so you can clear this up. Okay, so this, like I said, is not the graph of fx. This, is, this particularly is the graph of the derivative. So if in this particular graph, the graph is above the x-axis. Then because the graph is above the x-axis, and I'm going to highlight it over here, this is where the graph is above the x-axis, there. So if the graph is above the x-axis, then the y is greater than zero, which means in this case, the first derivative is greater than zero, because this graph illustrates the first derivative. So here, y indicates the first derivative, which is greater than zero, which means I can then make a deduction of fx. And please remember, this is not the graph of fx. fx isn't drawn, so I don't have a visual picture of fx at the moment. But I can then make a deduction on fx because the first derivative is positive, fx is increasing. So in this particular example, I can then say f is increasing from 1 all the way to 3. That's it. So we're going to look at this, a couple of other stuff as well. The next thing we have to look at is we have to look at if the graph is then below the x-axis. So again, please note, this is not the graph of fx. This is the graph of the derivative of fx. So in this particular graph, if this graph is below the x-axis, which is over there, there the graph is going to be below the x-axis. And again, I'm going to highlight that for you so you can see where the graph is below the x-axis. So, graph below the x-axis means y is less than 0. But in this case, y is not fx, y is again equal to the derivative of fx, which means the derivative is less than 0. And that means in the original graph, if the derivative is less than 0, the original graph is decreasing. So in this particular graph, I can make a deduction about fx, and I can say fx from negative 5 to 1 the graph of fx is then decreasing. Right, now other deductions. At the x-intercepts, so where y is equal to 0, so those are the x-intercepts, again, not of the graph of fx, of the graph of the derivative. So at the x-intercepts, y is 0. So because this y illustrates the derivative, it means the derivative is equal to 0. So that means the x-intercepts of this particular graph are then the turning points of the original graph. So these x-intercepts are the turning points. So I can then go and I can say at x equal to negative 1 over here, because that's an x-intercept, and at x equal to 7 over there, because that's an x-intercept. So the x-intercepts of the derivative function, these, are then going to be the turning points of the original graph, which again is not illustrated over here. We don't know what the original graph looks like at this point in time. But we do know on the original graph that these two are my turning points. And again, if you look at the turning point, in other words, dy over dx equal to zero. Because remember, when we calculate a turning point, we're going to say it's where the first derivative is equal to zero. So dy over dx is equal to zero. But now the problem is this y value right over here in the graph is not defined as y or fx, it's defined as the derivative. So we are saying that the derivative of the derivative, so the derivative of the derivative is equal to zero. Now we know the derivative of the derivative is the second derivative. So the second derivative is zero, which then means the turning point 
of that derivative graph is then the point of inflection of the original graph of fx. So again, this is not the graph of fx, this is the graph of the derivative. So where I find this turning point right there at 3 over here, I now know that that is where the second derivative is equal to 0. So I know at x equal to 3, I have a point of inflection. Got it. So if you look through all of this again, if you look through all of this and you go like, no, I don't got it, that's absolutely fine. Just start at the beginning again and watch the video again because sometimes you do need to go through it a couple of times because sometimes your brain gets stuck on something and if you listen to it a few times, you'll suddenly go like, oh, I understand. Okay, so what I want to reiterate just quickly again this idea that if I have the graph of the derivative, then on that particular graph, my x-intercepts are not x-intercepts. My x-intercepts are actually turning points. So in this particular graph, the turning points of fx is 1 and 3. In this particular graph, the turning points of fx is negative 1, negative 5, and 1. Okay. Then also, where the graph is above the line. That is where the derivative is positive, so this is where the graph is increasing between those two values. Where the derivative is negative, in other words, where the graph is below the line, so in this case, um, from negative infinity to 1, or from 3 to positive infinity, it means fx is decreasing, because it's below the line, so it means a negative first derivative. Then over here, we've got... The y value there is negative, so the first derivative is negative, the graph is decreasing over there, and over there the first derivative is positive, so from negative infinity to negative 5, the graph is increasing, um, not increasing as in this gradient, but increasing on fx, and then from 1 to infinity, the graph is also increasing because it's above the line. So like I said, it's going to take a little while to get these things firmly entrenched in your head. We will also do an example. Hopefully the example will help on understanding these graphs of the derivative of fx. Okay, so this is the example we're going to do. It's in exercise 9.3 on page 224. We're going to do 8 from that exercise as an example. Now, they've given me a graph, and they said this is not the graph of fx. So again, I'm going to highlight that so you guys can see. Not the graph of fx, this is the graph of the derivative of fx. So, yes, for this particular graph, this is a y-intercept. These are my x-intercepts, and they didn't really give me a turning point, but we can actually go and calculate it. In fact, we'll do that a little bit later on. So, on this particular graph, y-intercepts, x-intercepts, but we've just spoken about the fact that if I then want to make deductions about fx, then please remember, these x-intercepts are not x-intercepts for fx. They are the turning points for fx. And where the graph is above the line, okay, then my graph fx is increasing above the line, and my graph of fx, not this one, my graph of fx is decreasing below the line. And this value right there, which is the turning point of this graph, is not the turning point of fx, this is going to be the, the um, point of inflection. So the point of inflection. I wonder if I did mention that. Yes, I did mention it over here. If I go and I find the turning point of the derivative, it's the point of inflection. Okay, so let's do the example. I know I keep repeating myself, but... Right, here we go. I'm, I'm a little bit worried, and I apologize if any of my anxiety is shining through in the video. Um, it's just that I love teaching this face-to-face um, -face just because there's lots of little problems that need to be sorted out. And I have lots of people asking questions, and I need to repeat again and again and again until I get that wonderful sound of, oh, I get it. So hopefully, even without me interacting with you guys, you will eventually go and you will go like, oh, I get it. Okay, let's, we can only hope. We can only hope. Right, so the first question on this particular graph is they say, for which values of x is f? Now, please note, not the derivative, which this is the graph of, but the original graph that is not drawn over here. So for which values of x is f increasing? And I did state that very clearly. I said, if the graph is above the x-axis, then fx is increasing. 
So I just have to see, where's this graph above the x-axis? It's here, from negative infinity to 1, the graph is above the x-axis. And then again, from 5 to infinity, the graph is above the x-axis. So f is increasing from x less than 1 or x greater than 5. I can also write this in interval notation. So x goes from negative infinity to 1, excluded, or then again from 5 to positive infinity. So this is where the graph is increasing because the derivative is greater than 0. Then, for which values of x is f decreasing? Now, again, we did talk about it. We say the graph of f is decreasing if the graph of the derivative is below the line. So this graph of the derivative is below the line between 1 and 5, which means the graph of f is decreasing where x lies between 1 and 5. Or we can write it in interval notation saying x goes from 1 to 5. That's where the graph of f is decreasing. So those are the first questions covering increasing and decreasing. The next question then asks, give the x-coordinate of the turning point of f. So we did talk about this. And by the way, I should have rather said the turning points because there's going to be two turning points for that graph of f. So in that first little section, I explained to you that the turning points of f are the x-intercepts of the derivative graph. So at 1, the derivative is 0, so that's a turning point. And at 5, the derivative is 0, so that's a turning point. So the x-coordinates of my turning points is at x equal to 1 and at x equal to 5. Right. Then they ask, classify the stationary points. So they are talking about these stationary points that we've just identified. Now, if I want to classify the stationary points, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the first derivative test. Now, we've spoken about the first derivative test, and that first derivative test talks about just before the point. So just before 1, what is the gradient, positive or negative, and then just after it. And also at 5, just before 5, what is the gradient and just after it. Now, you need to check this. If x is equal to 1, then before 1, the gradient is positive. Now, positive specifically, not because the gradient of this graph is positive. No, it's because the y-coordinate of this graph is positive. Because remember, if the y-coordinate is positive, then it means the gradient of fx is positive. So it's positive and then it becomes negative. So because it goes from positive to negative, it means in the original graph, so in other words, the graph of fx, the gradient goes from positive to zero to negative. So that means here at one, I have a maximum. So a maximum turning point. There we go, at x equal to 1. And then the other turning point was at 5. So if I go back to this one again, then you'll notice at that x equal to 5, just before 5, this graph is below the line, so it's negative. And just after 5, this graph is above the line, so it's positive. So the gradient goes from negative to positive because the y value goes from negative to positive. So if it goes from negative to positive, it looks like this. And I'm just going to draw it over here, and I'll show you just now why I'm drawing it over there. So that means here, where x is equal to 5, let me just state that's where x is equal to 1, and this is then where x is equal to 5. So that means over here, I've got a minimum turning point at that value of x is equal to 5. Right. And by the way, the reason I drew it like this is because if we now just connect those two points, not very well connected, but you get the idea. If I connect these two points, I then know what the original graph of f looks like. So this graph, which is the derivative graph, I can then from these deductions tell that my original graph, my fx graph, looked like this because of that first a maximum turning point and then a minimum turning point. But we will again refer to this later. Okay. Next. If fx is equal to ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx. So now they're talking about the original graph of f 
not the graph of the derivative. Determine the values of a, b, and c. Now, I've put an asterisk on this because they really, really don't ask this question. In fact, they sincerely dislike asking this question. Um, we are going to look at it, but like I said, if you have no idea what's going on, please don't stress. They've never actually asked anybody to find the equation of the original graph based on this derivative. But technically speaking, it's really not that difficult. Now, you need to remember, we've got some coordinates over there. We've got the coordinate at x0, y is 5, at x1, y0, and then at x5, y0. But please remember, on this graph, y does not indicate fx. Y indicates the derivative. So obviously what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find the derivative. So we're going to find the derivative and we're going to say that is 3ax squared plus 2bx plus c. Right, now I'll come back to this because I can now use the information given on this particular graph to find the equation of the derivative. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the points I've got, I've got the x-intercepts of this particular graph, which is at 1, 0 and at 5, 0. Now because this graph is a parabola, I can then go and say it's a parabola and I've got my two x-intercepts. So because I've got my two x-intercepts, I'm going to use this format of the graph. It's a times x minus x1, x minus x2. And I'm going to substitute that 1 in here, and I'm going to substitute that 5 in there. And please note, this is to get the derivative of fx, not fx. So, I can then say it's a times x minus 1, and then x minus 5. Which, if I just simplify this, gives me a times x squared minus 6x plus 5. Right. Now, I also have the y-intercept of that particular graph. So I've got the y-intercept of this graph. And the y-intercept of this graph is given over here as the point 0, 5. Now, because I've got the y-intercept, which is the point 0, 5, I can then go and substitute 5 in here, and I can substitute 0 into x over there. And I can say if my y value is 5, then x is going to be 0 squared minus 6 times 0 plus 5. So that means 5 is equal to 5 times a, which means a is then equal to 1. So therefore, I now know that this particular graph, let me just move that up slightly, this particular graph, which is the derivative, is then equal to 1. So I can stop the 1 in there. It's 1 times that, which is then just x squared minus 6x plus 5. But up over here, right up all the way up top, we went and we did go and we found the derivative of the function they gave me, this one. So I can now compare these two, and I can say, okay, so I now know that that 3ax squared is equal to x squared. And specifically, we're going to talk about the coefficients. We're going to say the coefficient of x squared here is 3a, and the coefficient here is 1. So I can say 3a equal to 1. The coefficient there of x is 2b. And over here, the coefficient of x is negative 6. So I can set that equal to negative 6. And then lastly, c, my constant value, is then equal to 5. And then I can just sort all of this out. And I can say, OK, so that means a is equal to a third. b is then equal to negative 3 and c is still then just equal to 5. So therefore, in my original function fx, I've got the graph of a third x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5x. So that was just using what we call the principle of equivalence, meaning we found the derivative based on this, and then because we had all of this information on the graph of the derivative, we found the graph of the derivative, which was a parabola. And then we just use equivalence, meaning we set the coefficients of each of these equal, and we manage to find the equation of the original graph. But like I said, this is a very strange question. I've never seen one in a past metric paper, but it's a useful skill to have.
Right, the next one. This one is probably going to be the trickiest one of the lot. Draw the graphs of y is equal to fx, y is equal to the derivative of fx, and then y is equal to the second derivative. Now, luckily, we have gone and we found the equation of that original graph. So because we found the equation of that original graph, it actually doesn't become too complicated to do. But if they hadn't given me this question and I hadn't found the equation of fx, if they just went and they said, roughly, please go and draw y is equal to fx, y is equal to the derivative, and y is equal to the second derivative. Then what you need to realize is you need to realize this. And this is actually the best way to do it because this is the way they do ask it in your past papers. So I always say, go first to the x-intercepts because the x-intercepts of the first derivative, those ones are going to be the turning points of fx. So I'm going to try and draw fx now. So this is going to be a turning point, this is going to be a turning point. And specifically, we've spoken about it. Just before the um, point, the gradient is positive, and then the gradient becomes negative. So the gradient goes from positive to negative. So that means I can put it anywhere you really want to. And that means it's going to go from positive to negative, so it's going to be that maximum turning point. Then I go to the next one and I say, okay, there's another turning point, because my x-coordinates are turning points for fx. Just before it's got a negative gradient, just after it's got a positive gradient, so I'm just going to go somewhere over there. It really doesn't matter where you go and just say it goes from a negative gradient to a positive gradient. So I can then just go and I can just connect the dots. There we go. And this is a rough sketch of the derivative, sorry, of the function of fx. So you'll notice something, that if the first derivative is a parabola, then the original function is a cubic graph. And, very importantly, they now want us to draw the second derivative. So if you draw the second derivative, we then need to go and do the following again. The turning point over here, and by the way, people, the turning point over here is going to be my point of inflection. So my point of inflection there is going to be where the second derivative is zero. So halfway between these two, we've spoken about that, halfway between these two points, which are the x-intercepts of the derivative, so they are the turning points of fx, I'm going to have over there, there we go, I'm going to have my point of inflection, so right in line with this turning point. Now, this is the only tricky point. We now have to go and we look, have to look at the gradient of this function. Because to get to the second derivative, we find the derivative of the derivative, which is the gradient of this derivative. So just before this point, the gradient is negative, which means below the line. And just after this point, the gradient is positive, which means above the line. So that means this is what my second derivative will look like. So, yes, people, I know this is a really, really tricky question. I can completely agree with that. But this is a skill that you need to be able to do. So we will, again, look at it um, probably later on if you come for ASPs and stuff like that. We will talk about it. Just to finish up on this particular topic, um, I just want to show you something quickly. Um, if we go and we say fx, the original function was cubic, and I just use that format ax cubed, plus bx squared, plus cx plus d. Now, this is not specifically referring to this problem. It's just talking in general. So if fx is in that format, then the first derivative is going to be 3ax squared plus 2bx plus c. Which, by the way, you'll see that if the original was a cubic graph, then the first derivative is a quadratic graph. So that means if I draw the derivative of a cubic graph, I will always end up with a quadratic graph, which will give me a parabola, like in this particular example. And then if I find the second derivative, that's going to be 6ax plus 2b. And you should notice this is a linear equation. So this is linear, and a linear equation always gives me a straight line. So that's going to be a straight line. Which then means if I need to go and draw um, from whichever way you go, if they give me a cubic and they ask me, please draw 
the first derivative, it will be a parabola. And if they ask me for the second derivative, it will then be a straight line. So just to show you a random example, nothing too serious, because a lot of the time in past papers, they ask you to draw this roughly. So I'm not even going to use a system of, well, maybe let's just use a system of axes because I need to see where those x-intercepts are. So again, if I start this time with a cubic graph, so there's my cubic graph, then wherever I find these turning points, if I go down here, that's going to be the x-intercept of the first derivative graph, and that turning point is going to be the x-intercept of that derivative graph. So these will be my x-intercepts. Now please notice, to go from y is equal to fx to that graph which is y is equal to the derivative, I now need to look at the gradients because the gradients of this graph is going to be the y-coordinates of the derivative function. So the gradient here is positive, which means above the line. The gradient there is negative, which means below the line. And the gradient there is positive, which means above the line. So that means this is what y, the first derivative of fx, is going to look like. So again, going from a cubic, and then the first derivative is going to be quadratic. And then again, if I want to draw that second derivative, I can then just go to the turning point of this graph. So the turning point of this graph then goes and it becomes the point of inflection. So that point of inflection is then going to be the zero for the second derivative graph. And now we're going to go and we're going to say here the gradient of the gradient is negative, so below the line. And here the gradient of the gradient is positive, so above the line. So that's what it would look like. Now I'm going to do one more. Hopefully if you see it again, this will become so much easier to do. So one more again. Now let's just do a different shape. So we're going to do that shape. So we're going to say again, this is y is equal to fx. Now, again, we go to these turning points because the turning points of fx is where the derivative is 0. So that's going to become the x-intercepts of the derivative graph. Got it. And because the gradient there is negative, the gradient of fx is the derivative graph, so that's negative, which means below the line. There the gradient is increasing, so the gradient is positive, so above the line, and there the gradient is negative, so below the line. So that means in this case, the parabola I'm going to draw is going to look like this. There we go. So that is going to be the graph of the first derivative. And then lastly, we're again going to go and say, but this thing is then the turning point of the first derivative, which means it's where the derivative of the derivative is zero, and where the derivative of the derivative is equal to zero, thereabouts, there, I've got my point of inflection. And my point of inflection is the x-intercept of my second derivative graph. So I will again go and I will say, before this point, the gradient, so the gradient of the gradient, is positive. And after this point, the gradient, so the gradient of the gradient, is negative, which means positive above the line, negative below the line. So that particular straight line will look like this. And that again is going to be y is equal to the second derivative of fx. So I'm hoping you understood that. Um, they can ask this of you in an um, exam. So please, 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 please be aware that you might have to be able to do this. Thank you for listening.